Buonasera e benvenuti a Digital Innovation for Culture. Sono Sara Angelini di MIT. Vi spiego come funziona la nostra piattaforma. È divisa in tre sezioni. Alla vostra sinistra lo streaming dell'evento. In alto a destra la chat moderata da Nicola Bruno su Slido. Potete porre domande e rispondere ai sondaggi, i cosiddetti poll, durante tutta la durata dell'evento. In basso a destra il live sketching a cura di Marcello Petruzzi, House of Tony che raffigura in tempo reale le idee che emergono durante la conversazione. Condividete le vostre domande e spunti anche sui nostri canali social, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, moderati da Lorenzo De Lucchi. L'hashtag dell'evento è MeetProctor. Hi and welcome to Digital Innovation for Culture. I'm Sara Angelini from Meet. I'm going to explain you how our platform works. It's divided into three sections. On your left, There's the live stream of the event. At the top right, our live engagement tool, Slido, moderated by Nicola Bruno. You can write down your questions and use the poll tab to interact with us during all the event. On the bottom right, there's the live sketching by Marcello Petruzzi, House Atonic. He visually documents in real time the ideas emerging during the conversation. Feel free to share your question also on our social network. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, moderated by Lorenza De Lucchi. The hashtag of the event is Meet Proctor. Is he right? Well, I give the stage to Maria Grazia Mattei, Meet founder and president. Enjoy the listening. Salve, buonasera. Buonasera a tutti e buongiorno per chi ci segue da altre parti del mondo perché diciamocelo questi nostri eventi Meet oggi e una volta Meet Media Guru ma sempre di Media Guru stiamo parlando eh, sono seguiti anche a livello internazionale quindi grazie alla partecipazione di tutte e grazie anche alla presenza di eh, alla, al, al fatto che Nancy ha accettato questo nostro invito Nancy Proctor che è direttrice del Film Museum di Baltimora e penso di vederla eccola ciao Nancy ciao Maria Ciao cara, lei parla benissimo italiano ed è stata un nostro guru anni fa a Palazzo Litta qui a Milano come Meet Media Guru, quindi abbiamo già avuto occasione di parlare con lei e torna ovviamente attualissimo già tutto quello che lei ci aveva detto allora, oggi entriamo in un tema importante di come i musei devono e la cultura in generale deve entrare in questa seconda fase. Eh, noi abbiamo creato questo format che si chiama appunto intitolato Digital Innovation for culture, innovazione digitale per la cultura eh, con un obiettivo molto preciso abbiamo creato un format che prende spunto dai nostri classici Meet Media Guru ma abbiamo costruito un ciclo di incontri come ormai è uso in questo periodo e come speriamo che continuerà anche a svilupparsi anche nel prossimo futuro per allargare e creare circolazione di idee confronti eh, scambi eh, per poter veramente pensare a come possiamo proseguire offrendo sempre più un servizio e quindi benessere ai nostri cittadini. Il format che abbiamo eh, progettato, anche grazie ovviamente alla collaborazione alla, a MIT di Fondazione Cariplo, bisogna dirlo, queste iniziative sono possibili perché abbiamo con noi delle istituzioni che guardano e pensano al benessere delle persone, in questo caso come la cultura può creare e generare anche benessere. Ecco, il nostro format prevede ed è, dicevamo, due appuntamenti internazionali, non a caso il primo con Nancy Proctor, l'ultimo sarà con Maurice Benayoun e vedete in centro due charrette, virtual charrette, perché questo format l'abbiamo creato con il nostro partner che è la George Brown College di Toronto. La charrette sarà un momento pragmatico, laboratoriale, un vero e proprio workshop per interrogarci su quelle che sono le eh, questioni aperte oggi, eh, le questioni aperte che riguardano l'impatto col digitale, il coinvolgimento del pubblico, come proseguire in esperienze fisiche e digitali al tempo stesso e soprattutto come trovare sostenibilità. Il nostro laboratorio, la nostra charrette ti darà proprio, entrerà nel merito di queste questioni in maniera molto pragmatica. Con Nancy oggi noi affrontiamo invece eh, in una conversazione 
online, eh, siamo qui al Meet, alcuni di noi invece come Nancy sono a Baltimora, altri di Scassant, abbiamo ricevuto un centinaio di adesioni di persone che disposte e pronte ad ascoltare ma a dare anche il loro contributo, eh, quindi noi partiamo con un format che, eh, che deve generare inspiration, con Nancy entriamo nella dimensione della cultura e delle istituzioni, come risulta alla fine invece questo ciclo, di, questo pacchetto, questo ciclo di appuntamenti eh, entreremo più nella dimensione artistica creativa eh, voglio ringraziare degli sponsor in particolare Intesa San Paolo perché ripeto queste iniziative non si realizzano senza l'aiuto di queste persone e eh, sul, per quanto riguarda il, il nostro tema il nostro punto di vista come MIT per chi non ci conosce deve sapere che il MIT è il primo centro di cultura digitale di ispirazione e di diciamo, vocazione internazionale nato in Italia, a Milano, per creare proprio occasioni sempre più intens intense e intensificate di scambio, di confronto sul tema della cultura digitale. MIT Pensa ha un edificio in centro a Milano, l'ex spazio, spazio Oberdan, nel centro di Milano, da qui noi vogliamo essere un terminale, un punto fisico di una rete che stiamo costruendo con grande passione e, e anche successo anche in casa europea e con la collaborazione di Guru come Nancy Proctor eccetera, i nostri amici di una rete internazionale di personaggi fantastici, teniamo costantemente attiva l'attenzione su quelle che sono le delle questioni urgenti per porci domande e trovare delle traiettorie di sviluppo eh, e indicare delle strade, quindi MIT eh, aprirà in ottobre, segnatevi perché non abbiamo ancora il giorno preciso, ma siamo sicuri, Nancy, sarai con noi anche tu, eh, che eh, apriremo, inaugureremo finalmente questa sede bellissima qui a Milano in ottobre, quindi parte fisica. Qual è il pensiero di MIT? Due parole sole. MIT pensa che dobbiamo guardare, a una, nel, soprattutto nel rispetto al tema della cultura, a una dimensione che sia fisica e digitale al tempo stesso. Con questa eh, situazione che abbiamo vissuto, questa crisi che ancora non è risolta in altre parti del mondo, anche Nancy è, è in casa sua, cioè c'è il tema del lockdown, non riguarda solo l'Italia e non è ancora purtroppo finito questa, questa, questa emergenza, non è finita questa criticità, noi pensiamo che questa comunque c'è un'eredità positiva che vogliamo portarci a casa ed è il fatto di aver capito che possiamo essere interconnessi, possiamo lavorare insieme, aprire il dialogo, co-creare, ma il mondo della cultura in questo momento, anche attraverso e grazie alla rete, deve entrare in un'altra dimensione, che è quella di un rapporto sempre più stretto col proprio pubblico e al tempo stesso entrare in una logica di produzione di percorsi, di processi, di contenuti che tengano conto anche di questa dimensione più generale, direi globale, di dialogo e di confronto a livello internazionale. Ecco, io non vi tolgo altre parole, abbiamo un'istituzione che è il MIBAC eh, e con eh, Antonio Lampis che saluto, che ci ha mandato un suo contributo di saluto eh, e, di, mh, e di attenzione a questo Buon pacchetto. Pomeriggio. Antonio Lampis è, un nostro, eh, è il direttore generale dei musei nazionali del Ministero dei Beni Culturali e del Turismo. Eh, lascerei la parola ad Antonio Lampis con questo suo messaggio. Buon pomeriggio a tutti, sono Antonio Lampis e sono il direttore generale dei musei del Ministero per i Beni e l'Attività Culturale per il Turismo dal 2017. Saluto Nancy Proctor che ho avuto la fortuna di conoscere proprio con Maria Grazia Mattei, vera pioniera del tema di oggi, cioè l'innovazione digitale eh, nel panorama culturale. Anche questa direzione generale musei eh, si è molto impegnata nella innovazione del lavoro dei musei attraverso il digitale. In luglio abbiamo approvato un piano triennale per l'innovazione digitale che incredibilmente è stato utile in questo momento eh, della pandemia quando tantissime persone hanno scoperto eh, la passione per il patrimonio e per i musei attraverso il digitale. I musei in qualche modo erano allenati 
e da molto tempo con il Politecnico di Milano abbiamo un monitoraggio della reputazione online dei musei che eh, è incredibilmente cresciuta ovviamente nel momento drammatico eh, del lockdown ma che è stabilmente forte eh, da molto tempo e ci dà una grande soddisfazione. Io penso che il futuro sarà sicuramente quello del doppio binario, il digitale aiuta tantissimo a, a, a prendere prima, a prendere durante la visita museale e a, e a prendere anche dopo, a documentarsi anche dopo. Non, non intende sostituirla, sarebbe una follia, ma è un complemento straordinario che darà anche molto lavoro alle giovani generazioni che hanno scelto di studiare, nonostante tutto, ehm, le materie umanistiche. E le potenzialità di occupazione per storici dell'arte, archeologi, sceneggiatori, ehm, persone che vogliono lavorare sul rinnovo del racconto museale, che è quello di cui tutti noi abbiamo bisogno, ehm, le potenzialità del digitale in questo, in questo obiettivo sono molto forti. Vi auguro buon ascolto e buon lavoro oggi pomeriggio. Grazie. Buon pomeriggio a tutti, sono Antonio Lampis e sono il direttore generale dei musei del Ministero per i Beni. Grazie, no scusate avevo sconnesso il microfono, sono gli incidenti tecnologici minimi ma succedono. Allora volevo ringraziare Antonio per questo suo contributo, avete sentito anche l'osservatorio del Politecnico con il quale anche MIT collabora, eh, ci sono dei dati interessanti, abbiamo aperto il fronte con l'uso della rete eccetera del dialogo con musei, istituzioni e pubblico, e il pubblico e le persone, e quindi questo è un dato importantissimo, quindi è cresciuta la reputazione dei musei. Adesso lui ha dato un po' una sua idea, Antonio Lampis, del futuro dei musei. Nancy, sei qui ancora un attimo con me, ti sfrutto subito, ma secondo te il, che cos'è una battuta? È proprio tipo come un Twitter, 140 caratteri. Eh, che cos'è il museo oggi per te? Ah. Il museo oggi è distribuito, uh, distributed museum, che tro tro si trova a luogo in tanti posti uh, allo stesso tempo, quindi multi, multi platform. Eh, segniamoci questa prima battuta di Nancy Proctor, perché siamo <ride> proprio in pieno. Già ci si apre un, un panorama non solo di fronte, ma a 360 gradi con questa, con questa tua definizione. Ti ringrazio molto. Eh, io passerei la parola adesso a, a Nicola, Nicola Bruno, perché come avete sentito Sara, ringrazio tutto il team di MIT, eh, perché c'è una squadra fantastica che lavora con noi in questo momento, grazie Nancy. E, passerei la parola a Nicola, Nicola Bruno, che gestisce questo live attraverso uno strumento che abbiamo aggregato nel nostro cruscotto, come lo chiamiamo, eh, che è Slido, eh, beh, vi spiega lui, vi spiega lui il lavoro perché è attraverso questo che i nostri, mi dicono, 480 persone attualmente connesse con noi possono lavorare e dialogare. Poi sentiremo anche cosa accade sul fronte dei social e poi ovviamente daremo tutto lo spazio centrale al, al confronto e al dialogo con Nancy. Grazie Nancy, ci risentiamo tra poco. Thanks, Maria Grazia. Uh, we have just uh, opened a live poll on Slido, asking people from what city they are connected from. And uh, as you can see, we have a very diverse audience, uh, mostly from Italy, but also around uh, the world, like uh, US, China, Dubai, Bogota, Ottawa. Um, today, more than 100 people are participating as discussants in this uh, virtual roundtable with Nancy Proctor. Uh, some of them have already shared with us their ideas on Slido and uh, we invite you to continue to interact with us along all the lecture. Uh, you can reply to our live posts, you can share your questions in the Q&A tab. tab. And um, by the way, we are active not just on Slido, so on the Meet Center, but uh, website, but also on other channels in a multi-stream way. Uh, right, Lorenza? Hello. Yes, yes, you're right. Uh, we are currently uh, well uh, streaming on Meet's website, but we are also uh, on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, our 
amazing, amazing communication team is working hard in order to let people um, well, interact with us and the idea that we have is that this moment is uh, well unique in the way that we are all experiencing uh, since March that um, we have a lot of time to think and to maybe also imagine a new world. So I, I heartily recommend to post and using the hashtag uh, meet Proctor for sure use English or Italian as you like as you know uh, Nancy can understand very well Italian so uh, please 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 do not publish any derogatory remarks uh, please be kind and uh, enjoy uh, the, the the moment and so uh, I think it's the time so I would um, say that uh, it's great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Nancy Proctor. Uh, her mission is to, well, mm, promote culture and leverage digital tools as a, a way to make uh, innovation sustainable and relevant and accessible. Nancy holds a PhD in American art history and also uh, she, she can speak French, she, she can speak Italian. She lives in Baltimore where she leads the Peel Center that is the oldest museum in the United States of America. And so talking of the great United America, uh, United States of America, how things are going there, Nancy? Mm -hmm. Well, Lorenza, uh, before I answer that, I want to first uh, thank you and the entire MEET team. Um, you have done an incredible job preparing this, and I know from my own experience how tough it is. Um, so you're a true pros, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be back with you. Um, as you all know, my heart is still in Italy, so uh, even to be able to visit virtually is a great pleasure for me. Um, to answer your question, uh, when I last had the honor of speaking at a Meet the Media Guru event uh, back in 2017, I opened my talk with a clip from Gil Scott Heron's classic song, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, from 1971. So uh, again, to answer your question, I guess uh, we see that he got that right. Um, you know, Gil Scott Heron said the revolution will not be televised because, as he put it, television is the preserve of advisors and other liars. It's the dominion of the white tornado, white listening, and white people. So the revolution that seems to be growing in America and spreading even beyond is going viral on social media and then later being picked up by mainstream media. And this may even be the secret of its success. This is, in fact, how I came across a clip um, that was from a protest in my home state of North Carolina. It was recorded in Charlotte, North Carolina at the end of May. Um, and uh, it really profoundly um, shaped how I wanted to talk to you all today. So um, maybe you've seen it, but if you could play it for us, that would be great. But let me tell you something right here. This 16, these 16, oh my God. Kill these 16, what are we going to do? You tell me what we gonna but do. This ain't the way. Cause they ready to let loose. If the United States the president say, if you loot, we shoot. Then you see what's going on. I know it. It's it. going to go. But it's time to stand up. So at this point, go, at know. this point, I'm ready to die for what's something. going on. Let me tell you something. That's the problem that we got. What you see right now is gonna happen ten years from now. And at 26, you're gonna be doing the same thing I'm doing. You understand that? Ten years. You're gonna be right here too. But he also got So what I need what to do right on. now at 16 is come up with a better way. Cause how we doing it? It ain't working. He angry at 46. I'm angry at 31. You angry at 16? Mm. It's it's old, man. Man. It's old, you understand me? It's old. Putting yourself in harm's way is not the way. No, it's not. You and the other your counterparts the same age and that has that same power. Y'all coming with a better way. Cause we ain't doing it. Oh my God. And I have a five-year-old son. Oh my God. And it ain't happening. Mm. Mm. I marched four years ago. Keith Lamont Scott did the same y'all mm. doing. The same exact thing night after night. After night, 
It don't matter. Come up with a better way. You understand me? To keep yourself safe. You know, I obviously will never be able to fully understand the pain and the anger that these men are feeling, um, though I'm moved to tears, as you can probably see, uh, every time I watch this clip. Sadly, the racism that we all grew up with in North Carolina means that too much privilege separates me from grasping the full horror and the challenges of being black in America. But what sticks in my mind from this clip that I wanted to share with you today is the words of Curtis Hayes, who's the man on the right um, in the white t-shirt and the baseball cap. And he says to the young man on the left, what I need you all to do right now at 16 is come up with a better way. I don't have any answers either. And I hear that frustration with the status quo, with the systems of, po of power, and I recognize that desperate cry for someone, anyone, to find us a better way. You can go to the next slide. Um, elsewhere, I've talked about the difference between revolutionary and radical change, as I've named them. Um, I think of radical change as something, the larger wheel, that turns more slowly, but because of its rooted, even grassroots nature, is more lasting, it's more sustainable, and, and over time more impactful. But that radical change is driven by the faster revolutions of revolutionary change, the smaller wheel here. And uh, I am just amazed and really inspired by the unprecedented speed of the change now in each of these marches, each of these demonstrations is its own mini revolution that is pushing change deeper into the roots of American society. So my question now is how do we make the revolution stick? How do we keep up this momentum and make sure that these advances aren't turned back? Next slide please. Now the answer that I gave to this sort of question in 2017 was that you must start at the grassroots to affect deep and lasting change. And so in this spirit, um, I had started the Be Here Baltimore project in 2016 to help make the soundtrack of the city fully inclusive and representative of Baltimore's diverse communities. Could you go to the next slide, please? As of 2017, when I first got to speak with uh, the media guru, um, that project, Be Here Baltimore, had found a home um, at the Peel, the oldest museum building in America. Now, um, it has had many lives. It was founded by Rembrandt Peel in 1814. He was a technologist as well as a natural scientist and an artist and introduced gaslight technology to the city from his museum and uh, also launched the first gas streetlight network in the country from there. And that innovation was so significant that even today, Baltimore is still called Light City. Um, after Rembrandt's museum closed, he sold the building uh, to the city, and it became the first city hall. Um, when the new city hall was built, um, sorry, it became first city hall in 1829, and when the first city hall was built in 1875, the building started being used as male and female colored school number one the first of the public schools finally being built in Maryland for people of color, for African Americans, um, was able to offer a secondary school education. Now this is fully 50 years after white students had public school systems. And when schools were introduced for African Americans, um, at first, they only offered an elementary school education because it wasn't just deemed uh, necessary or desirable to offer a secondary school education. Um, but finally, uh, in 1889, the activists in Baltimore, uh, like Isaac Myers and the Brotherhood of Liberty, were able to have a secondary school curriculum added at school number one, which was based at the Peel. Um, that school quickly outgrew the capacity of the building, and um, a new and, frankly, much better building for a school was built.
built nearby. Um, and, and then the stored in building was frankly abandoned or left left empty for 20 years. Um, it suffered a lot of water damage due to a leaky roof, but in 2017 um, we took it over in a partnership with the city um, and started renovating it and relaunching it as a home for Baltimore Stories. We um, programmed for three years uh, in the building and uh, currently it is closed not just because of the pandem pandemic but even before that for our interior renovations. Um, we're located uh, downtown near City Hall which is a, a central point for the recent demonstrations. Um, on Sunday uh, we were able to add paintings to the front of the building um, if you see across the uh, ground floor there, the windows were boarded up. Um, they are actually original um, 19th century manganese glass, which is irreparable and irreplaceable. And we were concerned about them being broken, particularly while the building was not occupied. Um, and uh, this weekend, our artistic director, the artist uh, Jeffrey Kent, painted these wonderful um, Black Lives Matter signs for us to affix to the uh, ground floor windows there where there's also information on how you can share your story and also how you can uh, access free Wi-Fi um, to help you do so and to do obviously other things um, during the protests and the other activities happening um, there downtown. Um, so even though the, uh, the building is um, not active on the inside, we're trying to make sure that it's as active as possible on the outside and supporting our communities and supporting this movement against police, police brutality um, and in support of black lives. Um, next slide, please. Now, our core program um, at The Peel helps Baltimore's storytellers, and by storytellers I mean everything from griots, historians, artists, educators, students, and more, to share their stories of the city. Our mission is to help people see Baltimore in a new light. Now, Baltimore is, a, is one of the oldest cities in America, um, and its culture and its history are as rich and as broad um, as the world, really. But unfortunately, it's come to be known by a very limited number of predominantly negative narratives that seem to be recycled on the evening news until they become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So what we're trying to do is change the narrative about Baltimore to be more inclusive of all of its diverse communities and the full depth and the rich uh, breadth of its history. So to achieve this, we have developed a free app um, and online recording services that enable people to record their stories anywhere, anytime. Um, and we also provide funding, primarily in the form of micro-grants, uh, capacity, capacity building support, workshops, um, and resources, and a platform for storytellers to share their stories and be heard. Our Born Digital collection of recorded stories now numbers more than 1,500. And it's important to note that we do not own these stories. Um, it's, it's critical that the intellectual property remain with the storytellers because one of the outcomes we hope for is that should they so choose, uh, these storytellers have the ability to use their creativity to generate income to fund their further creativity and basic needs. Our job at The Peel is not to collect in the traditional museum sense and own their voices and their stories, but quite the contrary, to be a platform that amplifies and supports their stories and helps their, their voices be heard throughout a range of wide, uh, a wide range of free and open digital platforms, as well as through in-person events at The Peel and elsewhere. Next slide, please. Now, pre-COVID, um, we bridged the digital divide um, in Baltimore, which is significant. Um, it's a city with uh, a lot of poverty and, frankly, not a very good um, core infra in, uh, internet infrastructure or connection to the internet back backbone. 
So we would bridge that digital divide by going into Baltimore's communities with projects like the one you see pictured here um, in partnership with uh, a local ice cream company called the Taharka Brothers. And uh, we would trade ice creams for stories. Um, partnerships with community organizations are critical for sustainability at all times, but now more than ever. And in the second part of this talk, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit more about how we've entered into some other strategic partnerships in order to increase our reach and to amplify voices even across the digital divide when um, most folks are stuck at home. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in our National Landmark Building, our programs are driven by Baltimore's communities and creators. So instead of operating in the hope, which I think is fairly common in the museum field of we'll build it and they will come, um, we start with the people. We do what I call inverting the curatorial process. So rather than starting with a, a curator or a subject matter expert um, and developing a program top down, um, we start with a community. Um, typically, we're approached by someone from that community who's a storyteller or a creator. And um, they say, I have this story or this set of stories that I want to share. And that drives any research, any development of, uh, of objects, props, uh, materials to support the telling of the story. And so what comes out is a true process of co-creation, one that's very uh, grassroots up. Sustainable change, in my experience, rarely comes from the top. It has to be organic, um, it has to include, and it has to have the buy-in of everyone. And if you all were able to catch the wonderful talk um, recently uh, at the Alliance of American uh, Museums Conference, by it was a conversation among uh, Dr. Janetta Cole, um, the current secretary of the Smithsonian, Lonnie Bunch, and the director of the Oakland Community Museum, um, Lori Fogarty, um, Dr. Cole said, uh, quoted this, you know, just so resonant African proverb, if you want to go far, go together. So the co-curatorial process does change the relations of power at the peel up to a point. But if we can turn to the next slide, please. Um, but I'll have to say lately, inspired by the current movement um, in support of Black Lives Matter and against racism in general and in, uh, in America in general, I'm beginning to think that being community driven in our programming isn't enough. We also need to change the structures of power to ensure that our organization's leadership is more inclusive as well. The radical change of relations to power must run all the way through our institutions. Otherwise, we're frankly just putting different faces in the same old structures of power. As was seen with the US presidency, any gains made by seemingly revolutionary steps, like electing America's first African American president, um, can be too quickly reversed when a racist leader takes the place of his predecessor. So I think we need more than just a changing of guard. And um, again, I'm, responded, I'm reminded uh, of a quote that uh, has stuck with me since I first heard it by Audre Lorde. Um, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So I'm aware that today, more than ever, we need new tools, new paradigms to build new dwellings for our people and our culture. Next slide, please. Perhaps, as some have argued, getting stuck in um, and, and trying to figure out what we need to do and how to act right now is missing the point, that more powerful is envisaging what new, what more equitable structures of power might look like. Now, I'm a visual thinker, um, and this is an image that, again, has, has stuck with me over many years. Um, it is actually the Kogod Courtyard Roof. Uh, that uh, connects the Smithsonian American Art Museum, where I uh, used to have the great pleasure of working, um, and also the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and it is, as you can see, a sort of a three-dimensional network. It is uh, a great visualization, in my opinion, of what I've called the distributed network. Um, and this was, in fact, my response to Maria Grazia's question at the beginning about uh, what are museums today. Well. A distributed network, and I actually do mean this in a technical way, um, is something that 
people don't experience um, in very many places, but very powerfully, that's how the Internet is structured, as a distributed network. And I think it's significant that the Internet was designed by the military-industrial complex of the United States um, as a way of ensuring that content, communications, and information could uh, continue to circulate even in the time of crisis and could not be taken out by a direct hit on any given center. Um, so indeed, uh, information is replicated across the internet and one server or one router going down doesn't mean that it disappears. That's a really powerful model, I think, for envisaging um, the future structure of museums. Um, you know, museums for the most part, are structured, frankly, like medieval fiefdoms, with a, a feudal lord at the top, typically a lord, um, and uh, you know everybody else under underneath that person. Um, if we can start to envisage a network that even extends beyond the museum's building and staff to encompass many locations and many partners and communities and their collaborators. Um, then actually I think we have a very powerful model for ongoing sustainability. Because even if COVID hits, one building is taken out of commission because it's under renovation or someone leaves, um, the conversations can continue to circulate. And the work of supporting and preserving and sharing culture can continue. It's interesting also to think about, you know, a, a distributed network does not have a linchpin. It does not have a single point of failure. And I think the double entendre of the term linchpin in the context of American history uh, and its brutality towards people of African descent is a useful pun, although linchpin and lynching come from, from different roots. Um, as a model for museums and other cultural institutions, this structure basically means that the museum is where you are. Next slide, please. Now, that concept of being where you are uh, responds to Brian Stevenson's call for proximity. He's the founder and uh, leader of the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, and another kind of touchstone that I mentioned in my last talk um, before this group, he noted, we cannot make good decisions at a distance. If we want to change the narratives that sustain problems and thereby change the world, we have to get proximate. So next slide, please. But how do we get proximate during a pandemic? Um, this photo is of the Prado uh, reopening this past weekend. Now, safety has always been a big issue in Baltimore. Um, and it happens on a number of levels. So, uh, for example, we have collaborated with Baltimore City public high school students. And uh, before a project with them, the uh, project instigator did some formative evaluation with that audience and, and asked the students what their primary concerns were. And top of the list was safety. That, frankly, um, many of these students each day had to worry and wonder, am I going to get to and from school alive today? For those of us who have not had to live with that kind of pressure, I just want that to sink in for a moment. Um, so similarly, there is a concern from would-be uh, tourists and cultural visitors uh, to the city. Uh, again, partly because of this very reductive narrative that um, is circulated about Baltimore, um, that they're concerned for their physical safety to come to the city. And now, of course, the concerns about safety are not just about is there going to be violence, but concerns about contagion, um, about catching COVID-19, about being around crowds using public transportation. So, um, what will the museum, what will museum visiting be like post-COVID, and how can the Peel and, and perhaps other organizations that might recognize some of these challenges as well um, address both sides of this topic of safety? Um, next slide, please. To help me um, 
answer this question, I asked uh, the Brain Trust. Uh, again, I'm very aware that I never have all the answers on my own, so I reached out to a number of Peel collaborators. And um, I was hoping, actually, to be able to share videos and audio clips so you could hear them speak their words directly. Um, but uh, not everybody was able to do that, and so I just have made, put everything in text. And, and I apologize in advance for, for having to voice this rather than um, hear, let, allow you to hear uh, these respondents' uh, replies directly. Um, but I'll just share with you a few of their thoughts. So uh, across the top of your slide, of, of the screen here, um, you see three men, Jeffrey Kent on the left, Devin Allen at the center, and Chris Wilson at the right. Um, they are all uh, artists and um, authors as well, um, are, are publishing or have published really important books um, about Baltimore and about their lives. Um, and they got together last night, and I'm so grateful to them. And um, brainstormed kind of what the Peel and other museums and galleries would be like post-COVID. Um, and they said, if the goal is to attract and include a diverse audience, it's imperative to provide access to those who cannot leave work during the day, Monday through Saturday. Um, we need to extend to donating schedule. The other the museum might be five, twelve to eight, just a simple. No generation differently. Okay. Um, apologies if this, if you've already heard some of this, but again, I think I think these points bear repeating anyway. Um, so uh, the feedback from um, Jeffrey Kent, from uh, uh, Chris Wilson, and Devin Allen is again that if our goal is to attract and include a diverse audience, we've got to be open at the times that those audiences, those diverse audiences, are actually available um, to come to the museum or the gallery. So it might be uh, during the day, uh, one, one day of the week, and in the evenings, another day of the week. They noted that different generations interact uh, with art and with exhibits differently, and so do different income levels. And so exhibition design and experience design needs to respond to that. Um, there is an opportunity, perhaps, um, in the, the kind of linearity that we'll, we'll need to design into our exhibit visits in order to maintain social distance um, that can actually make uh, certain kinds of accessibility, both to content and for people with disabilities, easier. So there are opportunities um, in some of the constraints that are being imposed on us uh, for a post-COVID museum experience as well. Um, the uh, artists also noted that um, there's going to be an increased demand for cross-platform experiences um, that, you know, those of us who've been fortunate enough to have internet access throughout the pandemic um, won't necessarily want to give up some of the uh, new kinds of experiences that we've been able to enjoy, like online presentations of exhibitions and artwork and related programming. And I can say that at the Peel, 
um, we've had larger audiences than ever before for our online lectures um, and tours. In fact, larger than we could ever physically accommodate in our building, which is relatively small. Um, so, so there's an opportunity there, but also a challenge. And um, again, I think this is why uh, meets. Uh, mission and, and work is so important, there is nothing more difficult technologically, I would argue, than um, bringing physical and virtual audiences together in the same space. So this is something that we're going to need to respond to as a demand and an expectation, but it's not going to be easy, I'm sorry to say. Um, some of the things, though, that we might think about in terms of online exhibitions and presentation of images is in the same Certain audiences, anyway, have been taught how to visit a physical gallery and how to get the most out of that experience. We may need to help our audiences understand the best ways to get the most out of an online presentation of artwork. And it's going to involve things like the quality of the image. Um, also, watermarking and protecting intellectual property so that the audience can have a rewarding experience but the artist's rights and income are not lost uh, at that expense. Um, we need to think about how the experience of standing in front of an artwork in person might have be explored in different ways um, in an online space. Um, they noted that there will be new career opportunities, for example, social media uh, content directors and, and that kind of a team have become more important than ever. Um, and I think we should expect to see those expanded as resources allow. Um, they're also very interested in, in new designs for fairs, for art fairs, that incorporate both uh, conventional style breakout, uh, conventional style exhibits with um, breakout learning and experience opportunities and virtual interactions uh, with live online content. Um, they wonder what openings and closings will look like. Uh, what does each uh, sorry, um, might they be week long, for example, rather than just happening in one brief moment um, in order to allow not just more people to participate, but more people from different time zones even. Um, really, the, the basic question is, what is each party in the exhibition and museum visit experience want out of that experience, and how can we cater to each of those? Um, Glenn Muschio, um, who is a professor at Drexel University, uh, responded that he too saw a lot of this blurring of the lines between the online and the in-person experiences and opportunities to extend museum visits online. Um, he particularly pointed out how people might prefer to use their own devices, like their own smartphones, rather than using borrowed devices. And indeed, this was something else uh, brought up by uh, Jeffrey and Devin and Chris, that things like VR headsets not only may not be accessible to everyone um, as personal devices, but they may um, raise some contagion concerns. Um, Dr. Daryl Peterkin, um, who's actually our, the vice president of the Peels Board, um, responded that he felt people are craving multisensory experiences. We've been limited uh, in so many ways for so long that um, we're going to gravitate towards things that will delight us um, in every way. And of course, there too is an accessibility opportunity because the more multisensory an, an experience is, the more likely it is to be accessible for people who have different learning styles, different needs, and different abilities. Um, he also suggests thinking more about the pop-up, um, how to adapt and expand the use of pop-up exhibits to reach further into our communities. And um, last but by no means least, um, Robin White Owen from Media Combo on the right, um, based up in New York. Um, she commented that people may be less inclined to visit a museum casually or spontaneously without a specific person, uh, purpose. Um, so we might need to really think about making everything timed um, and then, of course, the additional promotions that are necessary uh, to enable people to uh, access those uh, timed and ticketed events. She also cl she closed by saying she hopes that what she's seen in New York um, this new habit of being kinder to strangers is maintained, of feeling like a community, um, facing a common challenge, and pulling together around that. So um, uh, another uh, comment that um, I would add um, 
from from Robin's uh, uh, feedback is that curators and other known storytellers or entertainers may need to be more available than just for an exhibition opening and providing an audio tour. Uh, so that's interesting that again, although being together in person is in some ways the most problematic, um, it is that live voice that we may be craving the most. So how can we make that safe? Um, and Jeffrey and Devin and Chris talked about, for example, visors and the way that it might be possible to have microphones more easily under those than masks. Um, but in any, any event, this kind of thinking, focusing on what people need and meeting that need, will be the path to staying uh, relevant. And I would add that alongside the validation of digital teams and their work that has come about as a result of what museums have been doing heroically and rapidly online in response to the pandemic, um, there are a couple of causes that really haven't been discussed very much outside of the digital sector but which take on a new urgency um, in a world where we're doing more and more online and at the same time trying to be more equitable and inclusive and deep, you know, changing these deep structures of exclusion in our, in our society. Um, so I would name net neutrality as a primary one. And I really wish I heard more museums up in arms about what's been going on in the United States in terms of limiting people's access to the internet. Um, the current administration and the uh, FCC that has been put in place by it is very happy to sell complete control of internet content and traffic to major corporations. And basically there will be a two-tiered system, in a sense there already is, where those who can pay to play will get their content out there and the artists and the cultural institutions and those who don't have the funds to pay for that access will not be heard. So this is taking the internet and changing it from this more uh, accessible, uh, flatter structure into a walled garden and frankly into another medieval fiefdom. Um, so I really think we need to be paying attention to that. I think we also need to be very careful about the forms of technology that have been proposed for use in terms of managing COVID um, and other contagious disease like tracking um, and facial recognition. And I was incredibly encouraged to hear that IBM has um, stopped work on its facial recognition technology um, and uh, Amazon will no longer supply uh, its technology to police forces. So we're starting to recognize that these double-edged swords um, too easily, particularly if the deep systems of power haven't been changed and the wrong people, fascists and racists are in power, those tools can really be used to hurt a lot of people. Um, basically, all of these technology issues may seem very remote from museums. You know, it's high tech, it's somebody else's industry and problem. But from my view, they go right to the core of what's going to be necessary to maintain the museum's brand as one of the most trusted um, institutions and, and kinds of uh, organizations in the world. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, this is a group of students with their teacher, Koli Tengela, from the Augusta Fell Savage Institute of Visual Arts in Baltimore. Um, and we've worked with them uh, in many ways. Um, in this photo, they had taken over the Peel to run their own storytelling summit. Um, and I'm very aware that um, not all of these students have access to the internet and to online uh, teaching during this pandemic. So again, to go back to this question, uh, this imperative raised by Brian Stevenson, how can we be proximate and stay relevant to these young people and others who may not have internet access at home um, during the pandemic? Let's go to the next slide. Um, one of the things that we uh, have done is we reached out to a wonderful organization called Libraries Without Borders. It was started in France to bring technology and digital content, access to that content, to war zones um, where all infrastructure had been obliter obliterated. Um, they've recently come to Baltimore to set up um, digital learning facilities in uh, laundromats, which are places that a lot of um, 
people use, a lot of low-income people use, and so it's actually a great place to, if you don't have internet access at home, to go uh, and get it there as, as alongside libraries. But of course, with the pandemic, um, the laundromats like the libraries have been shut down, so what Libraries Without Borders has been doing is um, sending out connected tech kits, as they call them. It's basically a laptop with a MiFi station and preloaded with content and resources and uh, access guides um, to help people get access to the information that they might need, be it about COVID or continuing their education during the pandemic. And so they've been kind enough to include the Peel Storytelling Toolkit and our app and access to storytelling tools uh, as part of these uh, tech kits that are being distributed to Baltimore uh, families and communities. Next slide, please. Um, another wonderful initial uh, initiative uh, started by our team member, Daisy Brown, um, who, like all of us, we're a very small group, wears many hats, um, but one of hers is staff photographer. And she started taking photos of people with their permission as she took her dog for a walk during the pandemic. She would do this while they were sitting on their stoops, which is a kind of an iconic thing to do in Baltimore, to hang out on the, your front stoop of your home. Um, and so from a safe distance, she was able to take their photos and invite them to record their stories. So we have a new um, initiative that allows us to um, share the stories and preserve the stories, even of people who uh, may not have internet access at home during the pandemic. Um, and uh, we've also introduced a, a story hotline. Um, we have a, essentially a 1-800 number, 833-TELL-STORY, that you can dial and record uh, your story at any time if you don't happen to have a smartphone or internet access. Next slide, please. Daisy also photographed the making of a recent film um, that the Peel was an advisor to uh, the production of. It's called By Any Means Necessary, Stories of Survival. It was directed by Tony Mendez and produced by Shante Daniels of the Baltimore National Heritage Area. Now, this film is about the squeegee workers. I'm sure those of you in Europe recognize this, the people who um, largely make their living by cleaning windshields at stoplights. Um, in Baltimore, this work is done primarily um, by young people, mostly but not exclusively young men. Um, many of them are homeless, um, all come from um, impoverished uh, families that uh, don't have the resources that they need even to eat. And so uh, these young people are usually out there to support their families and to make sure they get the next meal. Um, so in this film, um, we get to hear and learn from their stories across the digital divide, and we've done an online film screening of that, and, and we'll be doing another. Um, and that was, again, a really great way to share their stories and share their voices, um, even though everybody uh, was stuck at home. Um, next slide, please. Um, there's a, this, oh, sorry, go ahead. You could do anything who put your mind to it. Just constant will to keep getting better and keep going. It's it's awesome. And I want to see wherever you go in life and be there for whatever you do. John, when did they? Hey, you got a man! I think that you are an amazing young man, and I think that the sky's the limit for you. Sorry, I uh, was a little too quick to call for that, so I didn't give it its proper introduction. Um, what you've just seen is a trailer for another film, sort of a follow-up to the first film I mentioned. Um, it's being made by Miles Banks, and um, it's telling the story of Savage, who's uh, one of the uh, G300, as they call themselves, uh, squeegee workers based very near the Peel. Um, and they are actually uh, part of an a ice hockey team that was started up by uh, Noel Acton um, and his collaborators as part of Tenderbridge uh, Incorporated's activities. And so that's just a little teaser of, again, another way of sharing um, some Baltimore stories that perhaps people don't hear and that 
hopefully will help change their attitudes um, towards something that um, might seem to those of us who are privileged enough not to have to earn a living by cleaning windows um, as a nuisance or a, an intrusion or even a threat. Um, so um, I, uh, I wanted to share one last clip. Um, this is actually uh, from 2016. Um, and this, uh, this young woman, I think, uh, this little girl really, um, states the project and what we need to do, the problem we need to fix, uh, more clearly and succinctly than anyone I've heard. So um, go ahead and play that one, please. I come here today to talk about how I feel, and, and I feel like that doesn't mean anything to me. Great job. and mothers to be by our side. So I um, saw this clip when it was shared by Alexis Ohanian, um, co-founder of Reddit. He's also the husband of tennis pro Serena Williams. Um, and he's self-described as the son of an undocumented immigrant to the United States. He shared this clip when he announced on Twitter that he's stepping down from his position on the board of Reddit and urging the organization to replace him with a black candidate. He's also pledging all profits from his Reddit stocks to serve black communities, and he said he could make this gesture so that he could answer the question from his own biracial daughter, what did you do? Now, it's clearly easier for a millionaire to make such a gesture than most, but Ohanian's Ohanian, oh, um, announcement really made me think about how impactful, how important it can be to hand over the reins, to pass the mic, to share power, not to abdicate responsibility. This is a problem that was created by white people, and it is our problem to solve. But we have to recognize that we don't have all the answers, that the system we've built is far from perfect, and we really need to make room for others like the young man in the first clip, to come in and help us find another way. So with that, I will pause. And um, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Nancy, for your speech. Today, talking about inclusion and change is more relevant than ever. 
Um, also, our uh, discussions on Slido are uh, highlighting the importance of inclusion, of change. Uh, we are getting a lot of interesting feedbacks, uh, smart questions about the use of blockchain, the artist's rights, how curation skills change when we have a distributed museum model, but also a question about the tearing down of statues that connect with a whitewashed history. Oh. Um, what do you think about this, for example, as a, an art historian? Well, that one. And, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fully uh, in support of tearing down uh, statues that, uh, first of all, lie. Um, and glorify what should be a shameful past and um, that were created in, the lar in large part, at least um, around where I am, um, as a part of a deliberate rewriting of history. Um, yeah. So they are, to my mind, um, useless as historical markers, um, often perhaps this is irrelevant, but not, not terribly aesthetically um, important either. Uh, but, but I do think that it is, it would be wrong also to erase that those statues existed. So I would rather see some sort of a, a memorial to, you know, here there used to be a racist statue, and we took it down, and here's why, and here's what we're doing in its place. Um, that makes the history complete. Yeah, I'm, uh, I agree with you. And uh, I think that we are short in time, so we will continue to discuss in the second part uh, okay. of the Q&A, so you can uh, continue with the second part of your okay. speech. Okay, okay, sounds good. All right. Um, so um, the pandemic, as I mentioned, um, hit just as we were about to start interior renovations on the Peel's historic building, and the timing has allowed us to reconsider our IT infrastructure plans and to allow the Peel to think about, you know, what it might be post-pandemic in a way that, you know, other museums who aren't at a similar moment in, in renovations probably don't have the opportunity. So where we're thinking now is about the Peel is not just a platform for Baltimore stories and voices, but also a portal to other places in Baltimore and beyond, a safe way to travel in space and time to explore Baltimore's rich culture and heritage and its many uh, connections to the wider world. Um, next slide, please. The seeds um, of this pivot from platform to portal were already part of our ethos and activities. Our collection, other than the historic Peel Museum building, is born digital. Um, it's all of these recorded stories that we share online. And so that also made our transitioning to um, operating exclusively online a bit easier. Um, also, uh, next slide, as, as you may know, I um, am the co-chair of the MuseWeb conferences. And you can get to the next slide. There you go. Um, which uh, had a very interesting uh, timing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pandemic this year. Um, we uh, were meant to open in uh, Los Angeles on March 31st um, and run for a week um, in a conference hotel there. Um, and of course, we were not able to hold that meeting in person and had um, less than about two weeks. Uh, to pivot to moving the conference entirely online. And we were able to do so because we have such a generous and supportive community of technology experts who helped us do that. Um, most of the conference actually happened in Microsoft Teams, um, and we had special support from Microsoft for that. But we also um, were very lucky that our partners, Virtual Ability, um, worked with Linden Lab, um, who run Second Life, to build us a whole island um, in Second Life. And it was a really interesting experiment in using a virtual world um, as a meeting place. And um, I actually have written up the results of that online conference. Um, and perhaps we can share that link out a little bit later on. So um, anybody who's interested in uh, learnings from running an online conference can, can, can learn from us as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, inside that auditorium that you just saw, um, we were really lucky to have as one of our keynote speakers, Dr. Natrice Gaskins, um, who is an artist as well as a technologist and an educator. And she had actually done some really wonderful early work in Second Life in 2010. And so she mounted an exhibition of her work uh, here in the auditorium 
um, which is still there. Uh, and again, we'll share out the link um, so people can visit it. It's free and accessible if you can get into Second Life and are comfortable doing that. Um, so this, her work is really interesting to me because uh, she actually collaborates with algorithms to create her board digital artwork. So it's a very interesting new kind of model of a true blending of human and computer uh, in terms of original creativity. Um, next slide. Um, so inspired by this kind of experience of virtual worlds, including this wonderful 3D map of Baltimore circa 2015, which was created by um, UMBC's Imaging Research Center. Um, and, and in fact, in the very middle, you can see that little red building is the peel, um, the digital peel, as, as it might have looked in uh, 1815, shortly after Rembrandt Peel opened it. Um, and uh, we're, we're, so what we're, we're inspired to do is really continue having digital exhibition spaces. So um, our friends at Linden Lab are very kindly, they've taken UMBC's model, this model, and put it into Second Life, and now we're building out an interior virtual exhibition space there. And also, we're just about to start a website redesign, which will include a browser-based digital gallery. Um, and so I'm looking forward to collaborating with the artist Jeffrey T uh, Kent and others um, on doing that. Um, next slide, please. Um, since the um, pandemic hit, we've been running all of our programs online, including online film screenings, as I mentioned, virtual tours, talks on history, um, and also capacity building workshops for storytellers on everything from fundraising to how to make online programming accessible. And as I mentioned, we've actually had larger audiences once we've gone purely online than we ever had uh, in person. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing that we're kind of trying to leverage as we rethink what the Peel will reopen as post-pandemic and post-renovation is as a, a, an immersive space. So taking some of these digital experiences that have uh, kind of been honed online during the pandemic and asking how can we bring those back into the building as well. So again, this idea of blending virtual and in-person audiences. Um, this is an installation as part of a uh, uh, an experience created by Submersive Productions, who are a really outstanding local immersive theater uh, group. And I am just going to a little shout out for Baltimore. I do think that Baltimore has some of the most important and um, innovative immersive theater happening in the country. So be sure to catch that next time you're able to come visit us. Um, next slide. We also are very uh, lucky to have as our chief experience officer, David London, who is a curator, a ma magician, a performer, uh, a researcher, and uh, he has developed um, an actual time travel machine, um, which uh, it, in the past couple of years has allowed us to create experiences that took people back uh, 200 years to Rembrandt Peel's studio to explore it. And we're looking at how that can, using um, immersive VR caves, um, gesture controlled computing, um, and audio uh, augmented reality um, can continue that experience, both for people who come to our building and for people who are online. Um, next slide, please. In March, we hosted a truly wonderful exhibition um, called Renovations, created by the Strikeware Collective, um, which includes three artists, um, Christopher Kojar, uh, Jeffrey Gangswitch, and Molly Bendel. And um, they uh, offered this very multi-platform, um, very interactive experience that included everything from simple chalkboards and chalk to, as you can see, uh, VR headsets and immersive caves. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we think there's an opportunity to push further because post-COVID, um, people, I think, are going to be wanting these the kinds of more intimate, more personal and direct experiences uh, rather than blockbuster and kind of mass crowded experiences, um, which these kinds of technologies and frankly the small size of our building uh, really lends it to. We also see an opportunity in addressing this question of safety, both in terms of contagion and physical safety, to have the Peel be a portal where you can come and perhaps 
talk in real time um, through direct internet connections to people in some home or community of Baltimore that you may never get to. Um, and we're inspired in this by a project that was at the U U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum um, called Portal, um, where visitors to the museum could actually speak directly to people in a refugee camp um, in Jordan. So these are the kinds of things that uh, we're really trying to develop um, and reimagine um, the Peel uh, post-COVID, but also hopefully post-revolution, um, post-radical change. Um, though I, I know that's going to take probably as many centuries as racism took to put in place, but that's no reason to slow down. Um, and, uh, you know, frankly, if the Minneapolis City Council can um, dismantle its police department and start over, um, what are we waiting for in the museum world? Post-COVID, I hope that people will feel that they can come to the Peel to go anywhere in the world. And I think that's a model that's replicable elsewhere as well. That if we are both platforms and portals to culture, then people can see their local museum as a kind of a library, as a way of accessing not just the programming and the exhibitions that were conceived in a top-down way by the leadership and the subject matter experts, but as a way to connect with communities and with other cultures all around the world. So um, that's where we're trying to go, and um, I hope I'll get to hear from you all um, and your ideas because uh, we are building this plane as we fly it and uh, we could use all the advice and the help we can get. Nancy was amazing and uh, I must confess I was moved. So <laughs> sorry, so was I. I, I <laughs> past couple of weeks has just been very emotional so apologies yeah. for that but no no, no. <laughs> I was I was moving in a good sense I mean yeah, yeah. and I'm back because uh, well while designing this digital experience we try to let, let's say uh, get an idea of how, how digital uh, can be multi layers and so that's uh, the reason why I'm back and I'm trying to invite all the people and you for sure to take a look at amazing Marcello's Petrucci House of Mm. work is sketching and is trying to document in real time what you just said and it was wow it was a lot and yeah, Marcello yeah. is so good that yeah. I think he's doing an amazing and amazing work yeah. and plus and plus a lot of people are giving us an hard time and I'm I say us because uh, with me uh, a lot of people are working on that and Alessia and Matteo and Fatima for sure and all together we have a lot of pictures of you as you can see <laughs> <laughs> and I have two questions and the, the first one is by Andrea Cimatti on Facebook Mm. And Andrea uh, was wondering, what advice would you give to young people who want to work in museums? Ah, well... <laughs> Not a I, question. <laughs> that, that's interesting. There's been a lot of discussion about this because of so many job losses uh, during the pandemic. Um, and I have what I guess may be a somewhat controversial opinion, but um, I, I certainly would not say don't. I certainly would not say don't do a museum studies degree or other kinds of studies working towards that goal because even if in the end you don't end up in a job in a museum, I think museum training is some of the best in the world for doing all sorts of kinds of jobs, not just in nonprofits, but in, in other kinds of industries as well. Because it, it, it is that amazing combination of, you know, everything from technology and administration and finance and logistics to creativity and communications and interpretation and education. And I honestly can't think of a field that gives you that full range of experiences. Now, can we do a better job with, uh, you know, helping people not just learn um, museum work but get jobs? Absolutely. And we need to do that. And I think really the fundamental problem, at least in the U.S., is that higher education is just too daggone expensive. I don't know. I, I, I feel fortunate to be as old as I am because the rate of increase in cost since I graduated has just been astonishing and I don't know how I'm going to send my kids to school. So um, 
you know, that's, that's, a, that's a big problem. That economic barrier is going to continue to privilege certain kinds of people getting the training necessary to get the jobs. But I wouldn't let that stop you. I would just go in with your eyes open and, you know, be aware that you might have to do things a little bit differently than you envisaged when you started your degree. I mean, honestly, the work that I have done since I graduated did not exist when I was in school. When I started my BA, you know, it was it was 1986. <laughs> the internet was a brand new thing. There were no smartphones. There was no, you know, it, there was no AR, VR in, in the way that we have it now. So, um, you know, be patient um, with that and confident that um, if you know how to learn, you will adapt what you know to the new exigencies of a new reality. Let me say thanks from Andrea. And then I have another question on a big topic. Uh, the, the question is from Amal Malef, and uh, she's asking, how is your team composed at Peel Center? So I think she's, she's tackling diversity and inclusion. Yeah, yeah. excellent question. Um, we are about half, if not slightly more than half, um, African American. Um, we're a very small team. Um, I'm still the only full-time employee, um, and we have about eight or nine other people who work part-time and on contract with us. So that's kind of how I've tried to build diversity with very limited resources, is um, just hire as many people as I can and pay them as much as I can. We never pay less than $15 an hour, which is kind of what should be minimum wage in this country. It's not generous, but um, it's allowed us to get started. However, and this was kind of the point of my very emotional first part of my talk, I do think that we need to go beyond that. And I think the leadership of the Peel needs to be diversified as well, um, which again is not me saying I'm going to abdicate responsibility, uh, because especially as a kind of a startup, a lot still depends on me. And I've been very happy to use my privilege to try to build this institution um, under circumstances that a lot of people with less privilege just wouldn't have been able to afford to do. Um, however, uh, I have uh, we've started a conversation with our board, who are very supportive of the idea of really re-examining what the leadership structure should look like, and making sure that uh, my white face is not the only face of the institution. And um, well, I don't know if diversity—that is topic I do I do care of—is in a Slido, um, let's say, pool, and uh, all the, the amazing job and well, you know, uh, engagement that Nicola is taking care of. So I, I'm I'm well, I'm wondering if Nicola has some questions on the same topic there. <laughs> Yeah, actually, we are um, we are doing uh, our uh, discussions are, uh, dis uh, are doing a lot of work on Slido. Uh, we have asked them to um, to to, put, to 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 write down some uh, uh, good experiences of uh, digital experiences in museums around the world, and we have a very a very good mm. list of uh, best practice. Maybe you then see mm, more most of nice. them. Like, oh, I uh, love that having we, five minutes with a Monet alone. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah I love that. <laughs> it's an immersive, immersive yeah. experience. That yeah. too. And then we have the night watch experience at the oh, uh, yes, museum. yes, that's a wonderful you know. one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then we have asked to get yeah, to our discussions uh, what are the crea creative digital experiences uh, that you would like to see more often in museums and we see that uh, the most answered question is uh, collaborative storytelling yeah. platform so something similar to the job you, have, uh, you are doing at the Peel, but also site-specific immersive productions. And then uh, another question was about the top priority for museums in a post-COVID-19 world, and uh, the matter of uh, business models is the most uh, important, mm -hmm. important for our Can I discussion. just make a comment there? I would say you're not going to get the first one. You're not going to get the sustainability models without the inclusion being more complete. Yeah. So those two really go together. They go hand in hand. Yeah. And uh, yeah, actually, it's uh, also what you are you have written in your last uh, in the chapter of uh, that we have shared with our discussant. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I have just a, a short question about the post-COVID uh, um, momentum we are living now. Um, 
we have seen a lot of museums experimenting with uh, uh, live talks, uh, interactive workshops, uh, virtual uh, exhibitions, and so on. Uh, what uh, what you have liked more during the COVID uh, lockdown? Uh, what are the worst practice practice we should not should avoid in the future? And what we uh, what are the mm -hmm. best ones? The one we should continue to work on. To oh wow. Well, we did um, early on in the pandemic survey our uh, subscriber base. So these are, it's, it's a little bit self-selected because these are people who are obviously already connected to us online and get our email blasts and that kind of thing. But we asked them what they would like. And I was very interested to see that uh, top of the list uh, was lectures and talks on Baltimore history and Baltimore stories. Um, and then people were also interested in virtual tours, and this is something else that I guess there's been a little bit of uh, a debate about, you know, um, should we do virtual tours or virtual tours already dead? Um, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of like asking, are books good or bad? It really depends on the content. If it's a good virtual tour, there is an audience for it. Um, and in fact, one of um, our friends from Virtual Ability, the organization that we work with on accessibility online at the Peel and, and in Second Life, um, uh, didn't was not aware that there were virtual visits available of museums and she's paralyzed um, and has to remain in a prone position so can't easily go to a museum and um, it was really moving because she she was almost moved to tears by talking about how how much she missed the museums in Chicago mm. uh, where she's from so you know I reached out to colleagues and I said Who's got a virtual tour? And um, I was able to send her some resources from the Art Institute of Chicago and a few other museums. Um, and she was so grateful. And she was like, I had no idea. You know, this is wonderful. So, you know, really, uh, let's, everything's so specific. I just would be very suspe suspicious of any blanket statements about anything, that all X are good or all Y are bad. Um, it really depends on the context. And that's why it's hard to get it right. Um, what, what should we not do more of? As somebody who's been having to be a, a homeschool teacher uh, for several weeks, months now, um, boy, man, this online education thing's tough. And uh, there are many good reasons why I'm not an elementary school teacher. <laughs> so I would really like to see some ways that we can continue to provide online learning opportunities for our, our children. And my kids, who are ages 6 to 10, um, you know, are very adroit with screens and digital media, um, and they love using a screen. They hate online school. So why? why? It's it's not about <laughs> the technology. It's the content again and again yeah. and again. It's always the content and the experience design. So yeah. you know, bless the teachers. I don't know how they've done it. Um, as somebody tweeted out. Homeschooling teaches us all that teachers should make a million dollars a day in cash, and I wholeheartedly <laughs> support that. So I certainly don't blame them. This has happened so fast. But I think the best thing that we can do to support them is help them come up with better ways of, of, of teaching and creating online learning experiences. Yeah, I agree with you, especially on the ch teachers and children. Uh, and um, yeah, I I think that uh, we have a lot of questions on Slido. Then we will share with you a list of uh, questions, and maybe you can reply on uh, Slido too with uh, typing down the answers. And uh, I think that now we are short on time, and I will uh, pass the mic to Maria Grazia. Are you around? Eccomi. Eccomi, grazie Nancy, grazie Nicola, no. grazie Lorenzo. Grazie a voi. È stato, no, Nancy, è stato appassionante, illuminante come sempre, sei proprio brava perché mm. trasmetti una grande passione nel tuo lavoro e una grande esperienza. Quindi ti ringraziamo molto mm. per questo tuo contributo e questo interessante confronto. Allora, io eh, hai visto il disegno, di, eh, la, mm, la mm. Eh, allora, è difficile, è, è, hai, hai visto l'intensità dei concetti eh. che ti hai trasmesso. Eh? Voglio stamparlo eh. e averlo sempre per studiare eh. a lungo. 
Te lo manderemo e lo manderemo Grazie. a tutti i nostri partecipanti, Nancy. Abbiamo avuto 900 persone passa oh, wow. collegate attraverso il nostro sito sulla parte streaming, tutta la partecipazione social. Quindi grazie veramente per, anche a, 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 per aver speso così bene, così, di averci dato il tuo tempo, le tue idee, la tua passione. E grazie alle persone che hanno contribuito con queste domande. Come diceva, tu non credere, non hai finito di lavorare, perché le domande che arrivate attraverso Slido le, le sintetizziamo, ti manderemo un report a te, come a tutti quelli che hanno partecipato e che vogliono lasciare eh, il, loro, il loro nome, una loro mail, riceveranno, faranno parte di questo progetto Digital Innovation for Culture. Io avrei voglia di dire tante cose, posso solo sottolineare una cosa, fate pure vedere il disegno perché è interessantissimo la sintesi visiva, um, io voglio sottolineare come in tutto il tuo discorso poi di fatto c'è sempre al centro un'attenzione all'uomo, attenzione alle persone e, e questo è anche quando parli di virtual reality, quando parli di museo web, quando parli di queste esperienze, è tutto finalizzato a trovare con strumenti diversi un modo per coinvolgere no? le persone, per dialogare, per costruire, condividere storie insieme. Mm. E quindi si, si sa che abbiamo tanti strumenti a disposizione, si deve avere un'idea di quello che vogliamo fare e la tua idea del museo diffuso è bellissima mm. e, e siamo entrati in questa fase. La, come MIT noi non vorremmo che questa finestra che si è aperta di relazione forte sul mondo si chiuda perché tutti pensano a tornare a dei vecchi modelli, no? mm. o a dei vecchi nel senso validi, per carità, lo spazio fisico è importante, ma questa integrazione, mm. eh, insomma, non voglio ripetere quello che hai detto anche molto bene tu, su tutti questi punti ci torniamo Nancy, mm. perché con te, eh? cioè, quindi ti impegneremo in altri appuntamenti eh, e ti vorremmo poi riportare, rinvitare mm. a Milano quando aprirà Mitz. Oh. Magari sì, non voglio perdere tempo o far perdere tempo a parlare di questo progetto, ma quando tu parlavi di Baltimora, anche MIT come spazio fisico l'abbiamo concepito per essere uno spazio che racconta, che crea flussi, eh, non è uno spazio rigido fisico, è uno spazio, il mio sogno è quello di abbattere i muri. <ride> per cui non me l'hanno fatto fare, è un edificio del 1900, non si può, <ride> però abbiamo creato un modello con la Carlo Ratti anche di eh, fluidità e di uno spazio che è sia fisico che virtuale, uh -huh, uh -huh. E quindi il tema per noi è il dialogo e il confronto, quindi grazie per tutte le no. tue suggestioni, ci torneremo a lavorare, do Bene. appuntamento ai nostri alla nostra community, a tutte le persone che ci hanno seguiti eh, per il prossimo appuntamento l'incontro la, la, con Nancy fa parte di questo programma innovazione digitale per la cultura eh, la charrette è su iscrizione per un massimo di 30 35 persone però iscrivetevi ed è interessante perché sarà un laboratorio di idee che troverà e, e darà forma anche a delle soluzioni lavorando anche sul tema della sostenibilità. E l'ultimo appuntamento sarà il 30 di giugno con Maurice Benayoun, forse Nancy lo conosce, è un grande artista, personaggio internazionale, vive a Hong Kong, guarda, abbiamo trovato te negli Stati Uniti con questi problemi, ma anche Maurice a Hong Kong si trova mm -hmm. nel mezzo di un grosso problema dove il dibattito, la cultura, la circolazione delle idee giocano un ruolo fondamentale. Comunque con Maurice entreremo nel secondo tempo del tuo intervento, Nancy, sulla questione degli spazi virtuali, della dimensione virtuale e di come vivere la dimensione digitale nella relazione con, lo, con la realtà. Quindi grazie a tutti ancora per il tempo di tutti e per i vostri contributi. Nancy, ti grazie a voi. Presto. Grazie, cara. Grazie. Grazie. Buona giornata. Saluti. Sono stata lunga, pazienza.